And if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open them to Ephesians chapter 2 as we are continuing through our series through Ephesians titled Made Alive. If you don't own a Bible, I encourage you to grab one of those Bibles. We have some on a sound booth in the back. You can take one of those and keep that. That is our church's gift to you. We'd love for you to have that. Or feel free to pull up your Bible on your phone as certainly I think all of us at least have one of those things. Um, It's not hard to pull up there. So turn over to Ephesians chapter 2. Nothing I say will be as important as what God has spoken from his word. And as you're flipping over there, um, we are really continuing through within the series of Ephesians, kind of a a three-week section or three-part sermon series through the last part of Ephesians chapter 2, looking at verses 11 through the end of the chapter. And, And in these three sections, we've been focusing on the fact that we are brought near And in the first week, as we looked at the first section of that um, in 11 and 12, we saw that we are brought near according to the covenants of promise. We looked at this promise that was promoted in the Old Testament, these promises that were foreshadowed of what would happen with this being brought near, what God has spoken to his servant Abraham. And then last week, as we looked at verses 13 through 18, we thought that we are brought near and made at peace with God, this Trinitarian peace that was purchased by Jesus Christ on the cross, and that the dividing wall of hostility has been torn down. And this morning, we are looking at the last part of chapter 2 in verses 19 through 22, and seeing how we're brought near to a place, to a place, as we're going to see in God's Word. And there's really going to be three sections we're going to go through in this text. We're going to see our current residency in verse 19. And when you think of that first point we'll be in in verse 19, think of a home. And the second section, as we look at our Christian grounding in verse 20, think of a stone. And the third section on the church building in 21 and 22, think of a temple. So current residency, Christian grounding, And church building, or another way of saying that would be a home, a stone, and a temple. So let's go to God's word this morning. Like I said, we're in verses 19 through 22, but I'm going to begin reading in verse 11 just to kind of cap off this section we've been in. Hear what God's word for us this morning, church. It says, Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in the flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Then the verses we're in this morning. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word for us as your people. And Lord, I thank you so much for the wonderful promises, the wonderful reality of peace, and the wonderful dwelling that we experience in light of this section of scripture we've been studying. Lord, I pray that we would have a greater understanding of what you're doing in your church, what it means to be united to you and and peace with you, that we can now dwell with you. 
That, Lord, we would see the wonderful reality that through the work of Christ and through the peace that he accomplished, the curse is really being reversed in our access to God. And so, Lord, I pray that we would see these wonderful truths in your scripture. And, Lord, I pray that you would help us to just have ears to hear and eyes to see some of the beauty of what your word teaches in these matters. But, God, I pray that this would not be some mere intellectual study but that you would be showing us our sin. You would be showing us the ways in which we have not been faithful. And you help us to cast it on Christ, to trust in his grace and mercy, and to follow you in greater acts of obedience and faithfulness. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we jump into this passage, we are beginning in verse 19, looking at our current residency. And this, of all the sections, is probably the most redundant from some of the things we've already covered. But guess what? Repetition is a beautiful thing. We need to hear these truths over and over again. And listen to how the text that we're in this morning opens in verse 19, as we consider our current residency, our our home, in light of being brought near in Christ. It says, so then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. If you are from Kansas or the fact that you live here now, you ought to know that there is no place like home, right? There is no place like home. And here we see that in Christ, because of the peace that he's worked, because of the answers of the promises that he has made, that we are now no longer strangers or aliens. We are no longer outsiders. We are no longer those on the outside looking in, but as we are standing in Christ, we are home. Another way of saying it is this is where we belong. This is who we are. This is our identity as being in Christ. And we should see from this a glorious truth that we are no longer primarily identified with that past self, with that self that was not, not united to Christ, that self that was rebelling against him, that one that was far from him. And our identity is primarily now as one of being a saint rather than a sinner. Now in saying that, do you still sin? Of course you do. Do I still sin? Of course I do. But our primary identity is now in Christ. Our primary identity is not as a stranger or alien, is not as an outsider, but as one who has been brought near, one who resides with God. And there's two particular phrasings that he uses here to talk about no longer being outsiders, but those who have been brought near, those who are, what is their current residency? He says, but you are fellow citizens and saints. That's the first one. And the second is that you're members of the household of God. Let's consider the first part of that. He says, you're fellow citizens with the saints. You're citizens with the saints. Well, what does it mean to be a citizen? It means that you belong, right? It means that you not only personally identify, but you are in a formal commitment tied to what? To a particular nation, state, or kingdom, right? And for become citizens of God's kingdom. We are joined to his kingdom. It's not a mere allegiance in our heart, but it is citizenship within a kingdom. And that kingdom is the kingdom of God. We are joined to that. And we are citizens with the other saints. This is not solely a personal thing, but we are joined with others and we become citizens of the rest of those citizens, which are referred to as saints. Again, notice what's their primary identity. It's not sinner, it's not Gentile, it's not outsider, it's as saints. Now we know it's not because they're perfect in every way, but how God sees those who are found in him, those who have been brought near as saints, and how he sees you as you've been brought near is now you are a citizen in that kingdom with those saints. You identify with them. What does it mean to be a citizen within a kingdom? Well, it means that you receive all the rights and the protections of that citizenship. We see this used by the Apostle Paul in his life where he appeals to his Roman citizenship in order to get a more fair hearing in his trial. Well, it's so true for us, right? There's many privileges that comes with being a citizen of the United States, and there's many responsibilities that come with that as well. 
Well, so too for being members of the kingdom of God, joined as citizens with the saints, that we enjoy the rights and the protections that come from being within the kingdom of the living God. We are tied to the promises of God, and we are given the responsibilities of living in light of what God has spoken. He's given us his law and his gospel. He's given us his commission and mission, and we are to live in accord with those things. This is our participation in the kingdom. It's not merely that we receive the rights and the benefits, but also the responsibilities that come with that. But we are not outsiders. We have been brought near, and we become citizens with the saints in Christ. But it's not merely the joining of some nation and some sort of Sometimes we can think of that in maybe cold or distant terms. Not, it's not a warm thing necessarily to be a, a citizen of a nation, although there is certain parts of that allegiance um, that we have to um, the place in which we reside and where we're a citizen, and those are good natural things. But it's also, we're told, that we become members of the household of God, that as we're brought near, we're not just brought into his kingdom, we're also brought into his family. Now, this is not a new thing, as you might remember, as Pastor Tom was preaching in chapter 1, we see in verse 5 that he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. So in the gospel, in what he's done in bringing us near and bringing us to peace, he doesn't just join us to his mission, he joins us to his family. We become his children, his sons and his daughters, real children adopted into his real family. I believe this is one of the highest honors of the gospel is our adoption. So often we tend to think of the gospel as merely Jesus not punishing us for, for our sins, which is a glorious reality that we will not be punished for our sins if we are in Christ. But we are so much more than that. We become his children. We become his heirs. We become his sons and his daughters attached to his family. Is there a more intimate relationship than to be a part of the family of God? So we see that our current residency is with Christ. It's not a stranger. It's not an alien. But rather, it's a citizen with the saints, a member of the household of God. So I hope you see as we're coming near the end of chapter two here, so much of the glories contained within the gospel of what Jesus has done for us it is a high calling, it is a wonderful duty that he's given to us. And there's wonderful privileges and joys. And that's why when he began by saying in chapter one, verse three, that in Christ, we have received every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, that that's no small thing. That's not some small calling. It's not some simplistic thing, but there's a wealth of glories and riches tied to our current home in Christ. When we become partakers of the grace of God, we are joined to God. Our citizenship changes from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. We are welcomed into the family and the household of God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. And we will get into this in our final point, but in light of verse 19 and our current residency, we must see that we should feel most at home when we are with the fellow saints and citizens. We should feel most at home when we are with the family of God. We are joined to something. Do you see that in this text? You were strangers and aliens, but now you're fellow citizens. Do you notice that that's not a singular just talking about you, but it's a plural talking about the community. And you're joined to the household of God and the members of the household of God. Again, that is plural. We must see that in Christ, as we are brought near to him, that these are our people. This is our tribe. These are our kinfolk. We are fellow citizens. We are members of the household together. And thus, you should take great joy in the believers that God has united with you. Your current residency is not a single occupation or single person occupied home. The residency you have now, right now is not a one-bedroom apartment that you're living in by yourself. He's welcomed you into a mansion and a kingdom that's full of many other people. There's a lot more citizens. It is a big family that he's joined you to. And you should take great joy in the reality of your current residency. This is one of the reasons why we stress hospitality so much as a church. 
That as we're joined to a kingdom and as we become members of a family, part of the outflowing of that should be an incredibly intentional hospitality that we engage in with one another. These are our family members. These are our neighbors. These are our fellow citizens. And what do you do with family members? I hope that you eat many good meals and enjoy lots of laughter and joy together. You play board games. You enjoy life with one another, right? This is what warm families do with one another. And this is part of our being brought near is that we're joined to a people, a home. We are members of the household of God. This is our current residency. As we go into verse 20 and through the end of the chapter, I want you to see that God is building something. And the rest of the language that goes forward from here is really a lot of construction type imagery. And I want us to see in verse 20, our Christian grounding or a stone, and then the church building in 21 and 22 or a temple, all right? And for us to grasp the remainder of this chapter, you have to picture what's being described in your mind because he's using imagery to describe what God is doing through his kingdom work and through his gospel of bringing people near. And it's a glorious reality. So as we consider our Christian grounding or a stone in verse 20, we should ask, what are the house rules of this household we become member of? Who is in charge of this kingdom that we are now citizens of? What are the laws of this land? Who can join this kingdom? And we see all of that answered in our Christian grounding in verse 20. Listen to what God's word goes on to say. It says that we are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. If you were tasked to build a home, Do you begin with the windows? Do you begin with the roof? Do you begin with the walls? No, you have to begin with what? The foundation. And it's amazing as you watch modern construction projects, how long they can take on laying the foundation. It'll seem like often nothing's getting done even though there's people there every single day. And then once that foundation is laid just right, it can seem like the house goes up overnight. It's staggering how fast that they can frame walls and put siding on and put the windows on and put the roof on. It can go up very quickly, but the foundation has to be set just right or the whole thing will crumble and it will do so in short order. By God's grace, as we seek to build his kingdom and live as members of his home, we have a firm foundation. We have a strong cornerstone. And it opens by saying that this foundation was built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, on the apostles and the prophets. And I believe that this is a synonym for just saying the word of God is built upon the word of God. Because what does it say there? It says, well, the apostles, well, what is our New Testament revelation? It is the word of the apostles. The apostles functioned as Christ, New Testament prophets. And even the New Testament books that weren't directly written by the apostles were direct students of the apostles and were relaying the teaching that they had received from the apostles. The New Testament is the word of the apostles' prophecy. And what is the Old Testament? Well, often the Old Testament is referred to as the law and the prophets, or a shorthand is given for that of just the prophets. In other words, it is those who spoke with the authority of saying, thus saith the Lord, which is the scriptures that we have contained in our Bibles for us. So if this kingdom that we are a part of, and if this household we are a part of is built upon a foundation, the foundation is the word of God, the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And this is why we need all of the Word of God. We don't need 64 books of the Bible. We don't need 65. We need all 66 of them, and we need the entirety of them. As the Puritans used to say, the whole Bible makes a whole Christian, and we need every part of it, and you need every part of it. So as we're considering this building project and imagery that's being laid out for this residence of God and his people, I want to ask you, are you a person of the book? We know that the church and the kingdom is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, but is your life built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets? Are you studying the word of God? 
Are you going to the book? Are you seeking to learn more about what it has for you? This is one of those preacher applications that is pretty simplistic, but read your Bible, okay? Be people of the book. I know that's a simple exhortation, but it's an incredibly important exhortation. The truth that we have is contained within this book, and if you're never reading it and never studying it, you're missing out. By God's grace, you can come on Sunday morning and hear a sermon, but you're hearing it that filtered through me and for a very short period of time, once a week. Man does not live by bread alone, but by everything that comes from the mouth of God. How many of you want to go on a diet where you can eat once a week? That's not a diet I'm signing up for, okay? I, some of you might be incredible at fasting, but I'm grumpy after about 10 minutes, okay? I, I have a hard time going half a day without eating, okay? Well, we got the bread of life given to us in the word of God. Are you eating? Are you feasting upon God's word? And if you're not, and maybe you don't know where to start, you say, maybe I've, I've never read the Bible before, and I, I don't know where even to begin. I encourage you to come ask and, and say, get some advice on where to begin. I don't recommend necessarily just starting in Genesis and trying to read straight through. You'll do well through Genesis and even most of Exodus, and then you're going to trail off pretty quickly, okay? But I'd encourage maybe go through a New Testament reading plan, and there's actually a really good summer reading plan coming up that I'll be doing if you want to do it along with me. But we must be people of the book. We must be people of the word rooted to the firm foundation of the apostles and the prophets. But what does all the apostles and the prophets point to? What is the whole scripture ultimately about? Well, it's pointing us to Christ, the cornerstone. All the scriptures are ultimately about Jesus and the work of Jesus, which we get a beautiful picture of that in this text. This is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And that says Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. All of this is pointing towards the person and work of Jesus. Now, this is crucial as we consider a construction project, right? If the corner of your house is weak and gives way, that will not go well for the rest of the building. But there's so much more here going on than just a simplistic construction imagery and language of what's being symbolized here with Christ Jesus being the cornerstone. And one of the things I want us to consider this morning is the role that rocks play in the story of Scripture. All right, that's why I said for this second point, to consider a rock. And as your mind starts spinning, you'll realize that rocks are all throughout the Bible in all kinds of incredibly significant ways. Rocks that actually become quite important to the story of Scripture. Often rocks are used in order to help construct objects used for worship. You think of the altars that were made throughout the Old Testament. They were often used by the assembly of rocks. Or you think of Joshua as he's about to lead the people into the promised land as they cross over the river. What do they assemble? They assemble a tower of rocks in order to worship God for the work that he's doing. But certainly doesn't end there. What is one of the primary instruments of judgment throughout the Bible as people commit grave civil sins that require civil punishment? Well, it's a, a stoning, right? Right? that's used throughout the Bible, that those people are stoned as an act of judgment. So it's not only used for worship, it's also used for judgment. But what else do rocks do in the scripture? They're also objects of royalty. You think of the precious stones throughout the scripture and the roles those play. There's many mentions of stones throughout the scripture, whether it's gold or onyx or bdellium, and that's just to name a small fraction of them. And you might remember, actually, if you studied the garments that the priest used to wear, that they were covered with stones and symbolic stones that we won't be able to get through all the symbolism of this morning. But it's worth noting that part of their garment necessitated the wearing of precious stones. And then as we're considering the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, what was the first written word of God ever given to mankind? Well, it was what? The Ten Commandments, right? Because the first five books of the Bible were written by Moses, but he wrote those after the giving of the Ten Commandments. The first prescribed word of God given to his people was written on what? Two tablets of stone. It's kind of incredible to consider. 
And why was it that Moses was never able to enter into the promised land? What was it that he did? What act of disobedience led to him never being able to cross in? Well, it was the striking of a stone in the way that God had not commanded him to do. And we learn later that Jesus was that stone in a symbolic way that was struck. But it doesn't even just end there. And there's so many other examples that I could give that I don't have time to give. But one of the incredible ones is the great story of David and Goliath, the one that we love to tell our children. Well, how did David, this person that was pointing forward to what Jesus would accomplish as a shepherd king, slay the giant Goliath? We did so with a stone. And then in going into the prophetic text, there's all these ones that are mentioned over and over again throughout the New Testament, such as Psalm 118.22, which says the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Or Isaiah 8.14 says, "And and he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Then in Isaiah 28, 16, it says, Behold, I am the one who is laid as a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. And then in Ezekiel, verses 11, 19, as it speaks about the wonderful work of God turning people to himself, it says, and I will give them one heart and a new spirit, and I will put within them. I will remove the heart of what? Stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. It says that Ezekiel 11, 19, and also almost identical language is used again in Ezekiel 36, 26. Now, why go through all of that? Because we must see that there's so much more going on here biblically than Jesus simply being a firm foundation in a purely architectural sort of way. That him being the cornerstone is rich with biblical significance. All of that was simply in the Old Testament as well. I didn't even begin to get through all the New Testament examples of stones being used. And we'll get into that a little bit in the final point. But to summarize from the text that we just read in those different verses to understanding Christ as our cornerstone, that we must see that he is the place of worship. He is the one where the sacrifice was made, that he's a symbol of our deliverance and freedom, that he bore our judgment, the penalty of death, that he is the royal king worthy of all the precious stones, and he is the great high priest. He is the rock that was struck in the wilderness that produced living water. He is the word made flesh. And our way of saying that is he is living tablets of stone. And like the stone that, was, that struck Goliath, Jesus strikes and kills the power of the devil. He is the stone that the builders rejected that has become the cornerstone. He is our sanctuary, the stone of offense and the rock of stumbling. He is the promised cornerstone of Zion that whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. He is the stone who turns hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. It is on Christ the solid rock we stand. All other ground is simply sinking sand. We build on a firm foundation. We know that a foundation is not the end all of the building. And as we're going to get into the final point, we see the church building or the temple. We must understand that that foundation serves an incredibly important purpose, and that's to hold something up that we're getting at. So how do we apply the glories of that foundation that we have in God's word and in the Lord Jesus Christ that we build on that foundation? We build upon his word. We build upon his son. We build upon the solid rock, which leads to our final point, the church building in verses 21 and 22, as we consider a temple. Listen to how this chapter two ends. It says, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. 
Now, at this time, it is worthwhile to go back to the Garden of Eden, as we seem to have to do in every single sermon, because it truly is the foundation of the story and of our gospel. But what happened in that garden? Well, God dwelled with man. God walked with them. They had communion with God. It was a glorious picture of mankind being in right relationship with God, being before God without any shame or the guilt of sin. And one of the most terrible things that happened as a result of man's sin coming into the world is that they were banished from the garden. They were removed from his presence and no longer able to enter um, or no longer to partake of the tree of life. And one of this glorious pictures, just to note in that garden, is that they went out through the east gate. Okay, we're going to circle through that. And God put in front of that east gate angels to guard them from going in to his presence and towards the tree of life. They were banished from God's presence, sent east with angels guarding the way. And the scriptures going forward from there is a picture of God in types and shadows in the Old Testament showing that he once again would dwell with his people. We see images of that in the construction of the tabernacle or the temple. But even then, it was always veiled. It was always surrounded. It was always very strict regulations. It was a picture of God with his people. Well, it wasn't perfectly experienced by them. They knew that God had not abandoned them, but they did not enjoy his presence in the way that they did in the garden. And particularly guarding the most holy of holy places was a curtain on it with two angels as a picture of what had happened in the garden of Eden. There was barriers, veils, and even for the people who were outside of the Jews, there was even the court of the Gentiles to keep them particularly far away from the presence of God, which is fascinating to consider as we think of them being brought near in these verses we have been studying. But what happened? Despite these types and shadows, that's not where the story ended. But as Jesus came to earth, what did he come as? He came as God incarnate. He came in the flesh. God dwelt with man on earth. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, John's gospel tells us. He came into humanity in the flesh. And that's important because it's a picture of God once again dwelling with his people. And what he came to do in large part was to help his people to dwell with him again. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And as Jesus hung on the cross, what happened to that curtain surrounding the Holy of Holies? Well, it was torn in two as a picture of access to dwelling with God being opened up again to God's people. And Jesus did not stay on the cross, but where did he go to? He went into the tomb. A stone was rolled in front of it, but was that stone able to contain him? No, it was not. But he rose from the grave and conquered death is a glorious picture of the gospel. Jesus did not stay on that cross. And from this point forward, as God is building his church, as the resurrected Christ is on his throne, things were never quite the same. In very tangible ways, that curse of being separated from the presence of God is being reversed not merely in promises or types, but being experienced in real ways amongst the people of God. So let's consider some of the New Testament passages that talk about God restoring this presence with man as he is building this new and better temple. At the beginning of Matthew's gospel in chapter 3, verse 9, listen to what Jesus says in light of all we've been talking about, about being brought near and this imagery of stones and being brought into his presence as outsiders. He says, and do not presume to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up some children of Abraham. Isn't that a glorious picture of what God is doing? Friends, we are those stones that God is raising up and making us part of his family, children of Abraham, and being built into a structure. Jesus, throughout the Gospels, as he prophesied of the destruction of the temple, talks about stones being torn down. And then we see in 1 Peter 
chapter 2, I'm going to read verses 4 through 10. And you don't have to flip there, but I encourage you to just listen what is being described. It says, as you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourself, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Do you get the picture of what's happening in the gospel? God is dwelling again with man. Listen to our verses at the end of chapter 2. Again, it says, In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In other words, we as the people of God are being built up as individual stones into that holy temple, which what was the temple? It was the dwelling place of God. It says, In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place, for God by the Spirit, that God is dwelling again with man and the sacrifices that we offer are sacrifices of worship as the living stones grounded upon the chief cornerstone, Christ himself. We are joined together constructing the temple of the living God. God is with us always, even to the end of the age, as the Great Commission promises us. We are brought near, as we've been looking for the last three weeks, into the presence of God. And in Ezekiel, which is a hard book to study and a lot of imagery that is hard to work through, there's this incredibly um, prophetic vision in Ezekiel 40 through 43, a vision of a new temple and it's being constructed. And listen to what it says in Ezekiel 43, verses 4 through 9, about this temple that God is constructing and which was prophesied about. It says, As the glory of the Lord entered the temple by the gate facing east. I'll start, start there by saying the gate to the temple is facing east. Well, where was the gate that God blocked them from going back into the Garden of Eden? It was on the east. And now we have a picture of entering back into that presence that we were once removed from. Listen to what it goes on to say. It says, The Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court. And behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. While the man was standing beside me, I heard one speaking to me out of the temple. And he said to me, listen to this, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the people of Israel forever. And I believe that's certainly a promise for us as the church, as children of Abraham goes on to say, and the house of Israel shall no more defile my holy name, neither they nor their kings, but their whoring and the dead bodies of their kings at their high places by setting their threshold by my threshold and their doorpost beside my doorpost with only a wall between me and them. They have defiled my holy name by their abominations and they have committed. So I've consumed them in my anger. But listen to how it ends here. It doesn't end on that note. It says, now let them put away their whoring and the dead bodies of their kings far from me and I will dwell in their midst forever. God will dwell in their midst forever. He warns them to put away their whoring, their abominations, their defiling of his name no more, and to tear down the high places. And what is the beautiful picture in this temple that God is constructing? 
that they would dwell with him forever. But we must see as an application of this glorious reality of what God is doing in this constructing of this temple on the cornerstone with us being the stones built up, us becoming the holy temple of God, that his temple is a holy temple. It's not a temple that we ought to defile. It's not a temple that we ought to be flippant with. We are the living stones of the living God making up his dwelling place, and that has responsibilities for holy living. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 20, using very similar language as Ezekiel was using. He says, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Friend, if you are the temple of the living God, that is an incredible responsibility. God dwells in you. And that means as you sin, you're dragging God along with you. We should always pursue holiness because God is with us. He has redeemed us. We are his people and he dwells with us, but God cannot dwell in the presence of sin. Thus, we have a call to be holy as his people. May we not be the kind of people that would spray graffiti on the walls of God's holy temple. And by that, I mean we should never desecrate that which God has made holy. And I don't mean our just physical bodies. I mean us as people. May we live holy lives before the Lord. We are the stones being built upon the cornerstone, the temple of the living God. Live as restored men and women. You see, we don't only avoid sin as we seek to live holy lives, but we must realize the glorious beauty of being entered back into the presence of God, that we not only have the negative command not to sin anymore and not to go about the former way in which we used to live, but we must realize that as we enter back into God's presence, that we can now live the way God intended us to live in light of the second Adam, It's as if we're going back into the garden, but yet with the strength of the second Adam as opposed to the burden of the first. And thus we can take dominion as God called Adam to do in the garden, but we do so in light of the second Adam. We take dominion for the sake of Jesus, our King. We live fruitful lives and productive lives for the sake of God Almighty and his own glory and his own kingdom. We be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, adding more and more stones to the glorious temple of the living God. But we do so for the sake of God and for the glory of God. Let us dwell in unity with our God and bring glory to his name. Do you see the glorious fruit of the gospel in these texts? That the dwelling place of God is with man, firmly fixed on a cornerstone, And that we as God's people are his temple. He's chosen to reside with us. So often we speak about that reality as only a future promise in heaven. And we will see it in more glorious um, examples, certainly, in the life to come. But in this life now, God is really with you. His dwelling place is really with you. His presence is really with you. The Holy Spirit is a wonderful gift who's residing in you. And never take for granted the fact that you have become the dwelling place of God, and not in a sole venture, but you are one of many stones being built together into God's holy temple. And God's holy temple doesn't involve one brick. It involves many of them, and it's still an ongoing building project that's lasted for many, many thousands of years and will continue to go on. But you are a part of something bigger than yourself. God is building something, and you are a part of it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the glories of the gospel and that through the cross and through Christ our cornerstone that we can be firmly fixed to the firm foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ and that you are using us as living stones to build us up into your dwelling place. And that, Lord, even now, as we are going to join our voices in praising you together, that we are doing so as those indwelt by the Spirit of God. 
Where two or more are gathered, you are there because you dwell with your people. And Lord, would we never forget that we are worshiping at all times before your face and in your presence. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.